extensive. It incorporates uh, sort of uh, Western canon, uh, I would say particularly from uh, you know, the Bach B minor mass to, um, to Tristan, uh, and lots of stops in between. Uh, and uh, incorporates a great deal of study of uh, 20th century uh, avant-garde uh, music, uh, beginning with the Sacramento <coughs> School. Um, he uh, talks about, writes on um, all of these subjects, and he uh, has a particular uh, love of, I think, what I would call very, very popular music, um, <laughs> uh, especially music of the 70s, uh, and including, uh, some, uh, I think, really some spectacular work on people uh, like uh, Cher, uh, the Carpenters, uh, Liberace, um, <laughs> Gary and, uh, and uh, yeah, and I think what's really interesting about his work in this area um, is uh, that he takes his music seriously and has some uh, quite extraordinarily interesting things uh, to say about it. Uh, a, a good deal of this will be available in book form uh, uh, from the University of California Press. The title of the book is The Persistence of Sentiment, uh, Essays on Display and Feeling in Popular Music. Um, uh, Mitchell also has an interest in um, connections of music and nature, uh, ecology and nature, whale songs, um, uh, and uh, some, uh, I think, uh, interesting work in um, uh, queer musics. Uh, so today, we're moving into television and sci-fi, uh, and the talk on Battlestar Galactica. The talk is um, about an hour long. Uh, it includes uh, two brief music clips and two fairly uh, uh, DVD uh, clips that uh, uh, you will be setting up for us, and then we'll have time for some um, uh, questions after uh, afterwards. What I would suggest, um, as you um, get hungry or thirsty, just get up and help yourself uh, throughout, and we'll all leave in a very jolly mood an hour or so later. <laughs> all, all the wine is now here. Welcome, Thank you. Thank you. I have been complaining to people for the last week as I was finally making my last decisions about what I could cram into an hour. That it was really a lot like working on a film, it's just that the film was over 45 hours long. Uh, so it's really constantly a problem of, of time scale in dealing with television. Uh, there are a couple of rather lengthy clips because I think one of the important things to focus attention on is the way that the large scale structures of the television show act. Um, at the same time, since it is television, we do have a little bit of some looseness in this. And so I do want to emphasize that you are encouraged. Please get up, get refreshments. You know, we won't have real commercial breaks, but you know, <laughs> even so, it's the way of living in television. Uh, the other thing I would like to do before I begin is ask a very quick question. How many of you actually watch the reimagined Battlestar Galactica oh, regularly? Okay. So some of you will actually hear, y'all those, those, will hear some things that you already know. Uh, but I'm trying to balance the amount of, of information for novices versus all this people really experienced. So, the sci-fi channel show Battlestar Galactica, now in the middle of its fourth and final season, has received a great deal of critical praise, not only for its exceptionally fine acting and high production values, but also, and most especially, for the way in which its stated goal of reimagining the hoary subgenre of space opera has intersected so brilliantly with the socio-political Thousands. The reimagined show's primary creator and executive producer, Ron D. Moore, has always been explicit about his goal of creating dramatic reflections of post 9 11 America. And no one acquainted with the show would question that the goal has been successfully achieved. A little backstory can clarify the historical situation for those of you who don't know the new show. In the beginning, there was Battlestar Galactica, a short lived television series that premiered in 1978 as part of a science fiction revival energized by the astounding success of Star Wars and the syndicated success of Star Trek. The original BSG, which is how I'm going to refer to it normally, uh, was conceived by Glenn A. Larson, who adopted a number of elements from the Book of Mormon and Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods, blending them with the Cold War concerns of the late 1970s. In this original series, the Cylons, who are robots created by an extinct reptilian race, have attacked a group of humans called the Twelve Colonies of Cobalt. 
without provocation, forcing the human survivors to flee in search of the mysterious long-lost 13th colony known as Earth. Throughout the original television show, as well as its brief 1980s spin-off, bad guys and good guys are clearly demarcated, and the equation of the mechanically villainous Cylons with the Soviet Union was obvious to everyone who saw the original series. The show's dualistic tastes were, after all, perfectly congruent with the Reagan on discourses that seduced the US in the 1980 political presidential election. <coughs> like Star Trek before it, BSG enjoyed a complex continuing life in fan culture. Fan fiction circulated more or less continuously in the wake of the show, supplemented by comic book adaptations, novelizations, games, published interviews with the show's creators, public appearances by the creators and various stars at science fiction conventions, and so on and so on. And like Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica's demotic hardiness was the ground of its later reunification. In fact, I should say, Moore, who is the new show's executive producer and wrote many of the episodes, had actually worked on no less than three of the later Star Trek series spin-offs, that is to say Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Now, almost every aspect of the Star Trek franchise, its visual style, its ethical commitments, its acting, its narrative strategies, its musical tastes, all of these have always been highly stylized. What counts for cinematic and television, televisual realism has never been a high priority in the Star Trek universe. And by and large, that kind of stylization has also been the norm for most television science fiction, particularly those shows that operate in the realm of what we can call space opera. The reimagined Battlestar Galactica, by contrast, was planned to create a kind of science fiction verisimilitude that was more characteristic of some cinematic science fiction, one thinks of the Alien series, for instance, is a good example of this, uh, and had made at least a partial appearance about a decade earlier in Chris Carter's influential X-Files. Important aspects of this realistic science fiction include uh, the processes of handling dialogue and characterization, uh, the show's editing and its camera work. Uh, you notice particularly in this a taste for handheld camera uh, uh, material and the adaptation of techniques that we actually normally associate with television news, um, as well as innumerable aspects of the show's musical scent. And these qualities were arguably made even more intense by a rich panoply of narrative tactics deployed in the show. Much rides, I think, on the linking of this narrative complexity and the show's reality effect. Not only the particularities of the series from episode to episode, but also Battlestar Galactica's situation in the ongoing transformation of television as a medium in the, year, in the 2000s. And all these are really part of the same tale. Now, to get to this, let me give you a moment's casual TV theory. Television programs, as we all have experienced, are famously much more porous, more amorphous, certainly less text-like objects than cinema films. The omnipresence of commercial breaks in network TV, as well as a lot of cable TV, is only one of the most obvious disarticulators of narrative. Glancing over the history of TV, we might actually also include um, aspects such as the evanescence of live TV before the era of regular taping and rebroadcasting. Most programs and television events from those early days of TV, of course, rapidly moved into the memory of collective narrative. Uh, in the age of syndicalization, really what I would date from the early 60s on, old shows could be repeated in endless cycles, and in fact, some of us may be old enough to remember reruns as the major mode of consuming or TV. Um, but these reruns were often recut to add commercial space and played out of sequence. This was one of the primary spurs to the kind of standalone aesthetic of most uh, major shows from the late 50s and the 60s. Uh, the spread of VCRs and especially DVDs in their seasoned, uh, seasonal boxed set format actually textualized television shows.